Welcome back to KQM Global and the Change Foundation. I'm your host, Jay Menez. And today's guest is an actor, poet, writer, producer, and now feature film director. He's also Rufio in the classic movie by Steven Spielberg, Hook, and also Prince Zuko in Avatar. Please welcome my special guest, Dante Basco. What's going Dante, on? Dante, thank you. you very much for coming. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Always, always a pleasure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, you've got your roots in hip hop music, I understand. Yeah, definitely. I mean, me and my brothers came to L.A. Uh, over 35 years ago to, to get in the industry, but we started our whole career, um, you know, at the very ground level of the, of the entertainment industry, which the ground level for us is the actual ground. We were b-boys in the Bay Area in the 80s, and I'd say the the golden era of, uh, of hip hop, and we became popular break dancers in a group called Street Freaks, and we performed all over town, and then got picked up, started performing for San Francisco 49ers, and Oakland A's, and got scholarships to San Francisco Ballet Company, and started dancing with uh, the San Francisco Ballet Breakers, and so my career went into film and television, um, and then through poetry and music, but uh, you know, once a b-boy, always a b-boy. We're the generation that grew up as, you know, hip hop, the hip hop generation. This is the maturation of hip hop. Yeah, right. So, uh, b boy, breaking boy. Yeah, break dance. You know, yeah. break dancer, b boy. Uh, my name was my original name was Poppin' Fresh because I was like, you know, popular. And but I had like a, I was kind of like had a lot of different. I was like the, the the utility knife in the crew. I can do I can do a lot of different things. Went Poppin' Fresh and I went to defrost, but uh, Poppin' Fresh was like the OG name. <laughs> right on. Wish I could have seen that. Yeah, there's videos out there. <laughs> we have to scour YouTube for all that stuff. Yeah. And so you really made a name for yourself in that before you even came to Hollywood and became an actor. Tell me about kind of that transition and how you managed uh, dancing in the Bay Area and acting and going to class in Los Angeles. Yeah, you know, we came as dancers. And when you're in the Bay Area, which is a great place, is we became, you know, somewhat of a kind of a bigger fish in a smaller pond up there as far as the art scene um, and doing a lot of stuff, uh, winning a lot of breakdancing competitions on the weekends. Uh, like I said, getting picked up by these, you know, by the A's and by the Niners to start getting paid to dance. And then studying ballet at, you know, the world-renowned San Francisco Ballet Company and also breakdancing with them. Uh, and then also getting paid to dance in like the Nutcracker and things like that. Uh, all that happened uh, before I was, you know, before the age of 10. So me and my brothers were doing all that at 10, at, on top of battling and dancing in the streets of Telegraph Avenue on the weekends uh, in Berkeley or Pier 39 and, and you know, in the, in the city. Uh, and then we decided to make the move to Los Angeles. You know, my mom was like, there's a lot of things going on in the family at the time. And we collectively, all the brothers uh, decided, let's take our chance and, you know, jump into the ocean of what is Hollywood. And we came down with like literally in our old red van with a hundred dollars where my mom and my dad kind of gave us a year to kind of make something happen. And, um, you know, we were very fortunate. You know, I kind of booked my first thing I auditioned for and just was off running. But when you get to LA, uh, especially at that time, you realize this is, this is a film and television town. And so immediately we, we continued to dance and we danced, you know, we did a lot of videos and dance stuff. We danced for Michael Jackson, we did things like that. but we quickly got into acting classes and became actors. And we you know, studied acting for 20 years in conservatory while we, while we continued to work and audition. And, uh, and we were dancers and actors and then you know, became actors. Yeah, so all your brothers went into acting. Yeah, all my brothers are still actors. They all have, have had their, uh, you know, they have great in their own, uh, great careers on their own right. Uh, you know, I've got roles like Rufio and Zuka that became iconic. and became, you know, whatever, famous or popular, especially within the Asian American community and, uh, you know, the, the fandom and the Comic-Con communities around the world, but they all have had great careers. Right. Well, you and, and your brothers even were, were somewhat of pioneers as Filipino, Asian Americans trying to break into Hollywood. What did that look like at the time? It was really, fa really fascinating because coming to L.A. in the 80s uh, and being Filipino, you know, no one knew what a Filipino was, essentially. I mean, we wa I'd walk in a room and they'd be like, what are you? And they're like, I'm Filipino. And they're like, what is that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but being Filipino, where, you know, and I know you're Filipino, where 
we're kind of a hybrid race. We're, we're Asian, but we're also, you know, we'd be colonized by Hispanics. We're like an Asian Latino, and, and it would work out in a lot of different ways because there's a certain, uh, you know, hustle about L.A. And there's a certain thing about everyone trying to put you in different boxes and just being Filipino. You really don't fit in any of the boxes wholly, but you kind of fit in a lot of the boxes. And so growing up and just being a savvy young b-boy, you know, going to auditions and talking to, to producers and directors and casting directors, and they're like, well, you know, what are you? And I'm like, Filipino. And like, what is that? And I'm like, well, what's the role? And the role, what is roles like Mexican? And I'm like, well, you know, Mexicans were colonized by Spain and the part, you know, it's part Spanish, and that's what part Mexico is. That same thing happened to us in the Philippines, but also we're like the Asian Latinos. That's why we're connected. Oh. And then there was, those roles started opening up to me, especially during those, those times. And so I did a lot of Latino roles, whether it be Puerto Rican or Mexican or whatnot, or they'll be like, well, what is this role? It's Asian, or what kind of Asian? Chinese, oh, Chinese. You know, my grandfather on my mom's side, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're part Chinese. Oh, so yeah, so all those roles started opening up. And I got to play a lot of different Asian roles, um, whether it be Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, Vietnamese kind of thing in, in that era also in film and television. And then uh, almost 20 years ago now, I did a film called The Debut, which you know, which became the first, it was the first ever Filipino American film produced in uh, Hollywood. And I got to play the lead role, Ben Mercado. And that was really important to me. And I was proud of that. I'm still proud of that. It's a celebrated film. Yeah, that, that was amazing. I remember seeing that when it first came out. Yeah. In fact, when I was down in I lived down in Orange County. Okay. I, I met the director of that film. Yeah, Gene Kahanian. Shout, yeah. Out to, shout out to Gene Kahanian. Yeah, G good dude. I can't remember how we came to meet, but you know, we that was uh, um, it was great talking to him about you know that process. Yeah. And, and making this film. It was really a pioneer to kind of get that going, and uh, and that you know that's almost twenty years ago, and, and a lot of upon the the Asian American community, we, we need to make more films and we're, we're at that place now that all that has culminated in the last few years with Crazy Rich Asians and now being a time of uh, kind of the highest profile for Asians in America and Asians in Hollywood and the history of Hollywood and history of America. So we're at a very kind of golden era for what's happening right now um, as far as the kind of products and the contents coming out, things like Parasite winning Oscars, Crazy Rich Asian, fresh off the boat being on TV, and, and now there's a whole new generation of uh, young Asian artists is really exciting in front of behind the camera that, you know, we're all connected and we're all supporting each other. Mm. What was the most challenging part of, of trying to break into Hollywood as an Asian American actor? Well, the, I mean, specifically for it being Asian, it's just the lack of roles, you know? Mm. The, it, but the reality of breaking in Hollywood is um, whether you're black, white, Asian, Latino, male, female, gay, straight, whatever. The reality, come into this town, you're a million to one shot at best. Like, all of us are, you know? And so the hardest part is uh, really kind of trying to exist here. You know, mm -hmm. people to know who you are and what you do and, and who you are. Uh, part of... Um, I think part of the fortunateness of, that I have, my brothers and coming from a hip hop background, coming from a b-boy background is, we were in the streets battling people from young kids, six, seven, just random people in the streets and, and, and learning routines and doing these things and performing in front of thousands, tens of thousands of people. And the, the, the heart of the b-boy, the battle of the b-boy is like coming to LA, every audition is like a battle every mm -hmm. opportunity you kind of it's a, your turn to go in there and show out and i think we brought that fierceness to what we did as young actors and then of course going to conservatory and getting your skills and technique together to and your confidence you know mm -hmm. um but the hardest part in the industry always is being seen but not just being seen by you know the opportunities that people see but also having the the courage and the fortitude and the skill set uh, to reveal yourself. You know, a lot of people think they're coming to LA, to Hollywood to play other roles, to get away from themselves when they don't understand that you're a million to one shot and you're really, your only real lottery ticket is the courage to just show yourself. Because mm. that's the only, 
that's the secret weapon that no there's no no one else has is you and and a lot of people go through acting classes and a lot of people go through conservatory or colleges to get to a place where they can actually reveal themselves and the people that can reveal themselves um those are the people that have a shot to you know to make it mm. it's trying to get to that truth behind it all it's the truth mm. yeah and it's a you know it could be a lifelong process or it could you know some people come come to town and have uh, a bit of that coming into it yeah well you were fortunate to be cast so early on and you know as as you came into la but um was there any time that you thought about quitting and going back to dancing or doing something else yeah i mean you know i'm 35 years now a vet in this industry and it's kind of like uh it's too late to quit now <laughs> <laughs> i mean you get to a place where there's nothing else you, you you really know how to do um but also i've been very fortunate in my career to keep progressing and keep pushing myself to new uh adventures really um from from dancing b-boying to acting from acting to uh writing music and becoming a rapper from doing rap and music with my brothers to writing poetry and starting dpl the poetry lounge which has become the, bit, the biggest poetry venue in the country um and being a part of the poetry scene for years from writing poetry to then taking that writing and then writing plays and then from writing the plays writing screenplays and then writing those screen plays and then becoming a producer to produce the, it's like there's a process that happens and from producing for eight years asian american cinema i finally get to direct my first film that i, I co-wrote with my brother darian and so um yeah it's all a process you know and the crazy thing about the process in this town is there's no one leading it it's like you are leading your own process yeah. and uh hopefully you have some good mentors and hopefully you read some good biographies and hopefully you're, you're bringing things in, being inspired to kind of move your ship forward. But it's a very odd business because, you know, there's, there's a lineage and a history of, of our, of our, of our work. You could watch it in movies, mm. start from the beginning of Hollywood and, and you could read the books and there's, there's someone that has done something like you've done. And so there's a lot of cues of, of a, a, a blueprint of where you can go. But at the end of the day, um, nobody really knows anything in this industry. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? We've all had successes and we have inkling of how to make the next success, but that's what makes the industry so hard is uh, it's really on yourself to kind of move it forward, take chances, tell your stories. Hopefully that story resonates with an audience at any given time and um, can transcend, you know, what, what you made. That's deep, I like it. Well, you're a, you're a creator, so you gotta create. And then yeah. as, an, as an artist, you've done all these, experienced all these different art forms. Right. Is there something that you haven't explored yet that you've been wanting to? Um, everything, I mean, the great thing as an actor is every character you get to play is, a, is, is something you have to study, something, someone new, a new character, a new job, a new thing. And so as a filmmaker too, when you're telling stories, it's like, you be, you know, you're not an expert in anything, but you hire experts or you go around experts, whether they're an expert doctor or a plumber, and you try to find the fascination and the, uh, the awe in, in what everyone does. And so uh, that's what kind of keeps everything fresh is the next gig is something, you have to learn something new. Right. Always. Um, as far as mediums and uh, as artistic mediums, you know, I mean, I'm, like you said, I'm a creator. and uh, people always ask, like, do you like acting better or film acting or voice acting or directing or writing or poetry? Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, I'm like a lot of artists. It's really, it all comes from the same energy space. It's like, we all, I mean, I don't know, I want to speak for all artists, but I feel like it's this urge to express yourself. Like, we're, I'm, we're just, I'm just trying to express myself and I'm trying to say something I'm thinking about or some story I've heard or some story that I want to tell. And that story might come through a, a verse and a song. It might come through a poem. It might come through a whole film I wrote. It might come through directing and being part of a story and helping to cultivate that story. Or it might be come through the performance of it, you know? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we're just trying to express ourselves and tell story. That's like the, mm -hmm. 
the simplicity of it, you know. Has there been a consistent through line in your career with that message that you're trying to get out there? Yeah, I think, I mean, like I'm an oddity. I mean, everyone in Hollywood's an oddity. Everyone's a long shot and everyone has their own a true Hollywood story, right? But, you know, I'm considered like, you know, even though I'm not the first Filipino actor in Hollywood, there's been some greats before me like Ernie Reyes Jr. and cats like that that I looked up to before I got it. But I'm like one of them that came and they, people put the pioneering tag on me. And so part of my thing is really being the first and trying to break lines, you know, there's a whole generation of people coming up to me, especially Asians that grew up in the, the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, and they'll come to me in the streets and they'll be like, yo, man, you're the first cool Asian I ever saw on film and television ever in Hollywood, right? Which is fascinating, crazy to think about because when I came into the industry, you know, Asians were in a very small, uh, just, lane in Hollywood and when we know that lane stereotypical nerds smart guys long duck dong these kind of things that um, yeah they're stereotypical and can be seen as racist it's a part of our it's definitely part of the experience you know but that's like the only experience that was really being shown foreigners and nerds you know and when I came into the scene whether it was in Hook or whether it was in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or Hanging Mr. Cooper's I'm like all of a sudden it's like this cool hip other kind of Asian was in the room and doing things and uh, and going back to what I was saying before is about the, the courage to kind of reveal yourself. It's very easy in this town to try to fit into the boxes that they want to put you in and we want to go there because that's the job they're hiring for, right? Yeah. They want to hire you for that. And I had lessons early in my career where, where I was like, do you want me to do it you know, this way? I remember specifically I was doing I was up for uh, this uh, recurring role on Moesha, Brandy show, in, in the 90s. And they had this role, and she's going to this white school, and they're doing these characters, and one of the characters is more of a square kind of character. And they're like, I walked in the room, I was like, well, do you want me to do the character the way you wrote it? Or do you want me to, like, rock it Dante style? And they just started cracking up, and I, they're like, you know what, rock it Dante style. And I just did, I did it the way I'm going to do it, right? Um, consequently, I didn't get the job. <laughs> right, they hired a square white dude to play the role, and I was like, okay. And then they called me up the next week, and they're like, okay, so you didn't get that role, but guess what? We wrote a role for you, and that role became this character named Marco. And Marco's tagline was like, let's rock this Marco style. And so, like, you know, it tells you like sometimes you have to find out who you are. Excuse me. Um, when I talk to young actors, it's it's a very unique thing because we're actors and it's all pretend and it's all storytelling, right? But when we do a role, there's like roles, 10 different actors can do the same role and they can be 10 different great ways. The reality is you as an actor and the character are gonna intersect at a certain place and that's where you're gonna play it. You can't try to play it outside of yourself. You can't try, you, that's where you play it. You know what I'm saying? And whether or not you get the job, you got to understand that you're that's your gold. And that gold doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get hired for it, but that's where you're going to play the role. And hopefully that, you know, hope that's that you have to be all right with that. So there's an old saying that in acting class that you got to work on, you know, the character stuck with you, and you're stuck with the character, but then you also got to work on the character, and then you also got to work on yourself. Right. You can only go as far as who you are. Yeah. What you watch, you can expand who you are. You might be able to play that character in different places, but you can't go beyond yourself. You gotta work on yourself. For sure. That reminds me of an earlier conversation we had about uh, you know, competing with other people yeah. and, and these roles and 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 really the I th I think what to your point it was that you know, the big misconception. Mm -hmm. Is is that you're competing with all these actors, and you're really not. You're you're just competing with yourself to be the best actor you can be. Yeah. Because if you can stay in your lane and be that unique person, they're gonna hire that you for that. Um, yeah, definitely. That's yeah. The, that's the whole you know dichotomy paradox of the whole entertainment industry. Yeah. You know, there's there is an aspect of it that it's like. You know, your Tupac, it's me against the world. It's just me against the world, baby. That's, I mean, that is part of it. 
but yeah. then you understand when you're saying that you're not in competition with the world. It's just, it's you. It's yeah. really you. All right, there is no competition, but you're still against the, it's both is happening. For you're sure. in competition with yourself, but you are in competition with the world because you feel like, you know, your art is the cure for cancer. And if you have the cure for cancer, you have to do everything in, the, in your, in your, in your, body and your energy to kind of promote it and get it out there you do not want to die without putting your work out there you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. that's like amen that's the that's, that's 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 the tragedy of it all when you were coming up uh before you even found your first success as a dancer um what sort of mentorship or role models did you have um i mean i had a lot of you know of course i come from a filipino family so i'd like you know strong family, just kind of dynamics, father, older brothers, uncles, and so there's there's that. But as far as, uh, you know, you kind of have to kind of have it in yourself. And then as, as I kind of got into Hollywood, of course, um, acting coaches that really opened up the world to me, you know, coming from a real blue collar neighborhood, coming from the streets and coming from a place where it's not, you know, Hollywood and the arts was not really a world to me, right? It even started younger when we danced in San Francisco Ballet Company and the teachers there. Um, it's this weird thing that happens. It's like you're this kid that's from a blue collar neighborhood and your break dancing is something that is of your world and your peers and kind of what it is. You're rapping, you're doing this and that, you're, you're b-boying, but then you get into this fine art world, filmmaking, ballet, and you get these mentors, and what happens is the world opens up. You discover a world that you didn't know existed. It, it, it is almost the equivalent of Harry Potter. It's like you're just this kid doing your thing, and then you stumble into a world, and then the world of the arts opens up, and you understand there's a world of magic that you didn't understand, that you were always a part of, but didn't really, didn't really make sense. And so your mentors, your teachers, your coaches, directors you work with, writers, all of a sudden you understand that you're you're really dealing in a world of nothing short of magic. Um, and so th that's kind of, you know, the magical thing that happened. And, and with that, you know, you just, hopefully you gra gravitate to the right mentors and the right people because there's a lot of responsibility in mentorship and sometimes it's abused, and, and I wrote a book recently, and, I, and I've been in through some abusive situations in my own life, especially connected with the arts. Um, and so there's a responsibility there. And so as I grow up and I become a mentor to some of the next generation of young artists, I'm very cautious of that. And, uh, and you wanna, you know, it's a very important, delicate role as a mentor and as someone that is being looked up to, because there's young, young people Put a lot of faith in you and a lot of faith in whatever whether you have authority or not but um the responsibility of a parent or a mentor or a teacher is uh one of the most important it's not even a job it's just a responsibility that we can have um to kind of further the next generation in a, a positive way and i really mm -hmm. do believe that i love what i do and i love what i've done in my career and what i'm going to continue to do when i talk to young artists especially young asian american artists I go, you're supposed to do better than us, period. Like, I'm not scared of you. I'm not scared of you outshining me. You're supposed to do better than me. You're supposed to build upon what we built or what, what are we doing? I mean, that's, that's part of the process. Like, you know, the process of the artist is not unlike the process of other things. It's like, go find a master, become a master, pass it on like yeah. that's the martial arts that's luke skywalker that's everything but that's life like that's the life of who we are in this town go right. find a master study become a master pass it on that's a great perspective so as somebody that has been well as you said a pioneer in this industry has found tons of success and now is now uh older and wiser. Older and wiser is that a do you see that mentorship of younger people as as a responsibility or is it optional i think it look i can't tell anyone how to be or who to you know who to be 
for me, it was not an option. It just was um, evident. You know what I'm saying? It would just kind of happen. And I've been mentored. There's so in Avatar: Last Airbender, um, Mako, who played Uncle Iroh in the show, is a prolific actor. Mako, I mean, he's, you know, he nominated for an Oscar with Sand Pebbles. His career spans 40, 50 plus years. He's one of the all-time greatest Asian American artists, right? He also co-founded East West Players, which is a theater company that I also grew up in here in Los Angeles doing plays in, writing plays in. Um, and he was Uncle Iroh. If you know the show, the sage from Uncle Iroh, he was that to me. I, he did my uncle and my father on film and television like three, four times throughout my career, starting at 12 up to his last gig, which was Avatar Last Airbender when I was in my 30s and he was, I don't know, probably in his 70s. And um, he passed away and even in his passing, like he still was a mentor to me and taught me lessons. I had asked him questions and throughout my whole career. And then when he passed and, and realizing that I'm a part of that lineage of Asian artists in America, uh, which I didn't understand really until that point. And, and seeing that he created East West Players, and that's something that I got a lot of knowledge and, and experience from. And you realize it's less about you and more about passing it on to the next generation. And that led me to creating my first production company and starting shooting films out of Hawaii, Kinetic Films with James Serino out there. And we, I just created an Asian American film company, right? And people are like, why are you doing this? This is 10 years ago. And I picked up one of the kids from YouTube, Kev Jumba, who was one of the biggest YouTubers at that time, and we co-wrote a script and produced a script for him. Mm. And it was like, why, what are you doing? And like I said, that, those films and that conversation that was all led up to ultimately led up to, uh, I created a group called We on the Eighth where Asian Americans take over the eighth of every month to celebrate Asian media in America. Like forget Asian American month, we don't even know what it is. No one even, we know February is Black History Month but no, but not even Asians really celebrate it. You know, well, let, forget the month, let's take one day every month and celebrate uh, Asian media and, and, and start having a, a, a monthly group session of artists coming together and keynote speakers and whatnot. And, a lot of those, like I said, a lot of those conversations led up to, you know, me talking to John Manchu and him setting up Crazy Rich Asians and I'm proud to be a part of the, the, the voices that led to that and where it's going. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, uh, you know, back to mentorship, perhaps you'll be somebody's Mako one day. I mean, there's all this new generation of, of artists coming up who look up to you and yeah. And, and see you as that person. Yeah, I think when I was doing We on the Eighth, a lot of the young YouTubers came through and a lot of our conversations were, um, you know, they look, they look up to you. Uh, and it's not something as a young artist I was very comfortable with, but now decades in, and there's a lot of young artists that come to me now, like I grew up watching your stuff. You being here in Hollywood made me feel like I could be here. Um, and then talking through uh, the ups and downs of the industry, sharing stories, giving advice if, if needed, uh, just even being there to be a, have an ear mm -hmm. to listen uh, to what they're going through because things change, you know, and uh, stakes get high in this town. And uh, this industry can really, uh, it will definitely make you question who you are and what you, you know, what you think you are and who you actually are. And so I think to be a, an elder statesman in town to, to help some of these young artists do the next step, kind of get over some of the bumps that, that I hit mm -hmm. um, is part of, you know, it's part of my thing now. And, and, I, and I welcome it with open arms, um, trying to be you know, gracious at the whole time as, mm. as it all happens. I can see another 35 years ahead of you. Yeah. So elder statesman, you're... You're, yeah, yeah. you're just getting started, Dante. I'm just getting started. I'm a young vet, I guess. I'm a young vet. <laughs> That's right. All right, shifting gears a little bit here. Uh, what sort of racial injustice did you have to deal with coming up? Man, racial injustice, it, it, you know, we live in America, and it's very, you know, and I'm a, I'm a person of a difference. I'm brown, period. I'm brown. Like, that's what you are. And, and I'm Asian, right? 
Um, and I grew up in the neighborhood, and, I, and I've been on many panels and talked to uh, a lot of cats, and I've talked to you know, Juvie Hall, and I've talked in prison and to, to the inmates, and look, it's hard growing up in the neighborhood, right? I'm from Paramount, it's hard growing up in the neighborhood, it's hard being black in the neighborhood, it's hard being Latino neighborhood, it's super hard being Asian in the neighborhood. Like, who are you, where do you fit in, what's going down, you know? And when you're from the neighborhood, we all have our stories, you know, I didn't gang bang, I wasn't a bang, but you knew everybody, you were down with everybody, um, and there's racial injustice that you get, of course, by the cops, being pulled over by a cop and having that dangerous or at least very adversarial tricky situation is, especially us growing up high school and whatnot, it could be a weekly occurrence. There could be, is a weekly occurrence that you, that someone could get shot, you. You know what I'm saying? You're being pulled out of the car and, um, it's just a part of it. I mean, I'm gonna do a poem. So I'm a poet, right? So I'm gonna do a poem. So it's, remind me of the story. I don't, I don't know how you're gonna edit all this, but since we're all here, I'll just do this poem. It goes like this. Where are you from? Where are you from? Well, that's a loaded question. See, I grew up in a blue collar town, simply meaning the blacks and the browns, and me being of that category, plus my pops made less than 40. Geez, a year, it's clear to see that me, I'd be well, blue collar. Better yet broke most of the time, even better poor. But when you're young and you're poor, you don't know that you're poor. It never occurs to you that you don't have a bed. Everyone sleeps on the floor. 18 in a house, one bathroom, someone always knocking on the door. At least it was fun. Let's get back to where we started. Where are you from? See, where I'm from, there are cops and there are gangsters, also known as gangbangers. Not unlike the cops and robbers of the movies, but unlike the movies, it's not so black and white. There are areas of gray, and that is to say it's hard to distinguish the difference between being pulled over by a cop and being hit up by a gangster. Both evoke a bit of pain in the pit of your stomach. I think it's anger masked by shame. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me explain. Followed by a cop. Follow six blocks. Pulled over by the cop. He, he pulls you over. He looks at you as if you are a mark. Where are you from? He does not wait for you to, apply, to reply. Instead, he accuses you as you deny. You're from the east side. And no, sir, bow your head. Don't look him in the eyes. It's embarrassing being pulled out the car. sit on the curb watching the cars drive by. But being where I'm from, that's just another part of my life. Now, when it comes to the gangbanger, all you got to be is a stranger. When he asks you where you're from, you can feel it laced with danger. So watch what you say next, because you're playing with death. So don't claim the east and don't claim the west. Matter of fact, same rules apply. Bow your head, don't look him in the eyes. I ain't from nowhere, man. I'm just some guy. See, he too sees you as a mark. But they don't really see you, your face or your heart. All they see are marks. Now, me being me, I got a few tricks up my sleeves. Effed up situations, I've gotten out of a few of those by simply picking my nose. That's right, picking my nose. Check it. When the cop pulls up, I can feel the heat in his eyes. Or a Monte Carlo filled with gangsters pulls up next to my side. I pretend I don't see them, and I casually try to pick a booger from my nose. And for a moment, just a second, I'm exposed to be a man, not a mark, a human being just like you. Don't lie, you got boogers too. Seeing the cop, he continues to just roll down the street. The gangsters, where they just laugh and then they just leave. Sometimes when you see a little bit of yourself in someone else, it can set you free. And the funny thing is, I'm probably from where they're from. The other side of town, I'm just trying to get home. Like. The, wow. Uh, those are stories. <laughs> that poem comes from stories from my life. That's awesome. Of knowing cops and knowing gangsters and understanding that it's not black and white. There's a gray. Not all cops are bad or great. Not all gangsters are bad or great. It's when you grow up in a neighborhood and you live in an environment, there's a lot of gray going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What inspired you to write that? And when did you write it? My life. Uh, I mean, I wrote that years ago. My god sister's husband's a sheriff, and we were talking about stuff. And then I've always written about altercations with police because I, growing up in the neighborhood, you don't have a good relationship with cops. Mm. Even to this day, as a grown man living in Beverly Hills, friends of mine that didn't grow up the same way, it's like, why is when the cops around you, you always get nervous? Like, you're not. 
because it's not a relationship that we grew up in the neighborhood that was healthy, you know? And even my god brother, he was a sheriff in the Bay Area, and we were just talking. He's like, come on, Dante, you know what the deal is. But, you know, he was from the neighborhood, too. He's like, yeah. And he goes, we're just another gang. We just got a different backing, but guess what? It's cops and robbers, it's cowboys and Indians. Like, we all know the rules of the game. We can't, you know, you don't want us catch you out at the wrong time. We don't want you catching us out at the wrong time. But it's just a cycle that keeps going on and there's no one trying to really stop it because that's like job security. And I'm looking at my God brother like, damn, like. So that's what inspired me to write the poem is my, you know, me just kind of state where I'm from and who I am and my family and growing up, um, you know, because you're, you're in Hollywood and, and you live a certain, I ha do live somewhat of a privileged life, you know, but that's not how it always was. Well, you earned it, too. I mean, you earn it, but I have, I have a history, but then also this is a part of my history, and I, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the, you know, the relationships in the neighborhood, the relationships mm -hmm. of the quote-unquote cop and the quote-unquote gangster and the, the similarities of what it is to a person that is living in that environment, mm -hmm. who was me, and my friends, my brothers. Yeah. And here we are talking about the Change Foundation yeah. and the upcoming concert. Thank you, by the way, for, oh, you know, supporting and being pleasure. involved. I think it's a, an exciting and amazing uh, organization and idea. Um, I mean, we, d we definitely need change. I mean, we're at a breaking point society-wise. You know, we all feel civil war on the, on the brink of civil war. On the br it's already online. When does that go from a digital, virtual civil war to a civil war in the streets because of ideas, because of a narrative that was started a long time ago that is continues and continues to be fed? It's, but what you realize is, you know, I'm a filmmaker, so it's all story. Mm -hmm. America's a story. Racism's a story written by the ones in power, it's constantly perpetuated and we constantly feed into it. My industry too, you know? But the other great thing you realize is we're storytellers. We can change the story. It is time to change the story. It's time to look at our old stories and see what they actually are, what they come from, what they mean, and who we are now as a society not just a country, as a whole world society, who are, where are we going? The power to change the narrative is now, we can create a new story. We are, the story is changing right now. And so to be a part of that and to be in an organization that is seeing, you know, just the idea of a, of a life scholarship. It's a paradigm shift in aid, you know, yeah, college scholarship for a certain era, a certain time meant something and it's not, nothing wrong with college. I didn't go to college. You know, college was not in my, in, my, in my history. That's not what I did. Nothing against people that go to college, but it's not for everybody. That's, that's not the end all. And beyond that, the people that I know have gone to college, not all of them are living rosy lives. A life scholarship, mentorship, understanding that the ones that are in need don't just need it over here, we're gonna need it the whole way through. I was fortunate to have a family, even in the worst of times, even in the most brokest of times, living in a house with 18 people in one bath. Do you know what that means? 18 people, one bathroom in America, in Paramount, California? That's where we were at, and, and it was fun. You know what I'm saying? I don't like to look at my life as we were like in the hood and it was all, it, it was fun. I st we still had the greatest, it was some of the greatest times. But I had a father, I had family, I had people to get me through these times. The ones that, uh, the victims of, of violence, hate crimes that no longer have that support system and to be able to understand that they need it now, they need it young, they need not just the money, they need someone to walk them into the store to buy the shoes, not just the shoes. They need the process of someone to be there to help pick out the shoes. That's family, that's family. 
You know what I'm saying? That's connection. That's what we ultimately need. That's mentorship. That's human interaction, not just funding and good luck. That's not always helpful. Um, so I'm really excited about the potential of the change organization. And I'm excited about the artists coming together for the concert to, to promote what's going on. Um, I grew up with, with things like Live Aid, USA for Africa. Um, really great, incredible festivals that captured your imagination. Um, but for America, for kids here, for victims here, for us to understand we have problems here that are unresolved, that we can do something to help out, uh, that's really exciting to me. What should the narrative be to uh, perpetuate this positive change that we're all looking for? That's a good question. I think we're, we're searching for the right narrative right now. Uh, I, I mean, I think about a lot. I'm a writer, I'm a poet. I'm, I, I'm thinking about who we are, what everything means. History is, history is just a story. What's the new story? Can we, you know, part of me as being a, a brown person, an ethnic person in America is wanting to, us to really see who we are. Like, let's not buy into the old, just stories of what a patriot is and what it was and go, let's, let's really decipher who we are without the blind, um, the blind pride of America is number one, we're the greatest in the world. I fear that, you know, we have the, you know, myself included, I'm not making, putting myself outside of this, I'm American, proud to be American, but as a, as a whole, we're, you know, we're a very bad combination of uh, overall uh, ignorant and arrogant. And ignorant, ignorant and arrogance leads us to a really volatile, dangerous place. Part of the narrative I wanted, I would, I would hope for is to us to really see who we are, how we got here, and what's the real American story. You know, what's the real American story? And is there, even though it's ugly, even though there's genocide of Native Americans, years of slavery, a country built on free labor, there's actually, if we look deeper, there is something that is prideful even in the, the ugliness of what we've done as a country. Let's not hide the ugliness. Let's look at it, examine it, come to terms with it. The only way to move forward in a healthy way is to really understand who you are and understand what that is. I mean, who are the patriots? Understanding that the guys that left England to make America were the rebel rousers, were the gangsters of their day. Understanding the Boston Tea Party was them doing black market tea against the established government selling tea in England is no different than what the kids were doing, selling weed on the corners, doing, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's parallels in what's going on. The American dream and the American way is not necessarily what we're sold of just hold your nose to the grindstone, do the right thing every day, and you're gonna make it in America someday. That may not be the real American dream. The American dream may be Jay-Z, may be the crooked ladder, may be the understanding that the real American dream is the guys that went outside the system created something and got so powerful and legit that they came back to be on top of the system. And that's, you know, that's, that's also there, even though it's a, it's a Crooks and Castles mindset, there's a certain pride in that kind of America. That is a real part of America. We are the outsiders that somehow succeeded and made right at the end. I don't know what the new narrative is gonna be. I think collectively we're gonna find it, but Let's find the truth of the whole thing and not keep reliving, rehashing these old narratives that were only to really benefit one group. And that was okay for a long time. But the world's changed and the narrative has to change. And I think the hope is to us to really come to terms with who we are. Right on. Yeah, that's I, I've never heard it put quite that way before. And But I think that you've got it. You, know, I mean, you got a nail, it's man. It's just an idea. It's just ideas. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, we all have our own ideas. All right, man. 
before we go, yeah. I want to talk real quickly about your latest project. Okay, yeah. You just made your debut as a feature film, dir film director. Yes. And this was uh, the Fabulous Filipino Brothers. Yeah, the Fabulous Filipino Brothers. So Tell us about it. So it's a film I co-wrote with my brother, Darian Bosco, and then it's consequence some rewrites came from my little brother, Dionisio, and my sister, Ariana. So it's really a family affair. But it's my first time directing, and I, this is like the, my eighth film I produced. So it's about time for me to direct something. But it's still a scary thing, even though I've been around the industry a long time. And so going into it, I knew I wanted to do something. Um, if I'm going to do it for anybody, I'll do it for my family, you know? And it goes back to that that sentiment. But they also were my ace in the sleeve, like my brothers star in the film with me. So it stars me and my real brothers, and it's kind of like my big fat Greek wedding, Filipino style. But it's also kind of like I mashed it up with like the calamity of, um, of Pulp Fiction, but like, like not the, the violence of Pulp Fiction, but the vignettes and the calamity of, of Pulp Fiction. So it's four brothers, four vignettes, a linear story told out of order, all surrounding a crazy Filipino wedding. And so, it's, you know, it's a lot to, lot to do. My first time directing an indie film, we shot in my hometown of Pittsburgh, California, the Bay Area, and one of the vignettes we shot in Manila, which is an international film funded out of the Philippines from a company called Signal, a studio out there. And so it's kind of ambitious for my first time, and especially for a smaller budget film to be an international, internationally shot film. Uh, but again, my, my ace in the hole were my brothers, we grew up together. I know them very well. I studied with them for over 20 years. I know what they can do. I know what, I know their careers and I know what they've been able to do in Hollywood. I know what they haven't been able, what Hollywood has not been able to grant them role wise. Um, I've been lucky. I've been more fortunate in this, in this Hollywood game to have certain opportunities and certain roles, uh, and a certain shine, um, and, uh, I was really happy to have the opportunity to direct and kind of let them be the leads of their own of their own vignettes, the stars of their own vignettes, and really got to cater roles specifically to what they do best and uh, what they're gonna shine at. And I'm really, I really can't wait for the world to see what we did. Excellent. So, did you cast them? You're talking about the the strengths that each one have. Did you cast them? towards those strengths or the, the things that they are trying to get to? No, they're strengths. I mean, when yeah. you go to, when you act, you know, the thing about when you're in acting class with people for 20 years, at any given time, everyone has been in acting class, the, the, the so crazy thing about Hollywood is like, there's so many amazing actors here. We all went to class together, so you've seen the actors in class do the most amazing things. And then what you're able to do ultimately in Hollywood is a fraction of what your ability is. And that's that's the pain of so many artists in Hollywood, so many actors. Um, it's like a magic trick. It's a weird magic trick, you know? You can do something, I tell young actors, like you're gonna be able to do a lot of stuff. You study conservatory, study acting class, you're gonna be able to do all these roles from Shakespeare to modern stuff, all these monologues and these characters. And, and the reality is you're gonna be able to do a lot of things, but you're only gonna be famous doing one thing. You're only gonna get famous doing one thing. And if you get famous enough doing that one thing, they're gonna maybe let you do some other things and they'll be like, oh my God, it's so amazing because they can do this too. But the magic is that we all can all do all that. They can all do that. But a lot of actors can't find out what they're gonna get famous for. That's casting, they can't see what how the world sees them and where their magic's gonna be, how the world's gonna accept them, you know? And, and then the luck is finding a role that does that at the right time, you know, the right role with the right actor at the right time for the world to appreciate it. That's the luck. That's where people get things mixed up sometimes, but you gotta get lucky in this town. You gotta get good. Getting good's not lucky. The luck is the right role. Someone wrote something for you a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, that's exactly right for you right now at this age and time that already is lucky and that you can beat out a million people to get that role and then somehow have the luck and the good fortune that the very moment you do that role, the world is at a temperature of time and acceptance and they need to see that at that moment. And so it's widespread enough that you can propel you to the next place in your career. That's the luck. 
Getting good is not lucky. That's the work. The luck is the other things that are outside of your power. Yeah, that's a great lesson. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, congratulations for Thank creating you. something that allows your brothers to shine, uh, show their strength and, and all their uh, awesomeness. Um, I'm and, excited. As well as yourself. Thank you. When do we get a first look? Um, you'll get a look tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. How about the headed for film festivals in yes, the spring? Yes, uh, we, we, start, we started submitting some film festivals, of course, at the time of COVID. So all the film festivals we were accepted in, we're all pivoting. We're kind of figuring out if we can go to festivals. They're going to sell early, so we'll see what happens. All right, great. All right, got high hopes for the yep. thing. I'm sure it's going to do well. I hope so. All right, Dante, thanks so much for your time. Cheers. All right, man. A pleasure. All right, big thanks to my special guest, Dante Basco. Be sure to check him out on social media. Connect with him at Dante Basco. And look out for his new feature film, The Fabulous Filipino Brothers, coming soon. You'll hear about it on social media, I'm sure. Thanks for watching. I'm Jay Menez, and we'll see you next time at KQM Global and the Change Foundation. All right, brother. Thanks, brother.